Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. And we're honored today to present this great symposium with some amazing people that have been working with a long time. I'm going to introduce you to, to the panel. Our, um, each one of them has been an integral part of this, this research, and they're going to share what they've been learning in the last uh, year and a half or so. Um, Dr. Amid, I can't pronounce your last name. Cahil, Cahil Death. <laughs> uh, he's a resident uh, radiologist at Mount Sinai. Dr. Sagar Shah has been uh, one of the initial researchers, also a resident uh, radiologist at uh, Mount Sinai Icon Med uh, School of Medicine. Dr. Daniel Prime, she's an amazing pulmonology <laughs> fellow at Mount Sinai. Um, Jana Moore, who's our star radiologist uh, resident, also at Mount Sinai. And uh, we welcome you all. Please ask questions. They're really enthusiastic about what they do. They're very knowledgeable, and they, hopefully they can answer uh, a lot of uh, things. This is intended to be interactive, so um, it's not TV. You can talk back to us. Um, and without much ado, I'll just uh, give the microphone to our master of ceremonies, um, Jana Moore. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Moore. Today we present to you X-ray in Motion, Changing the Role of Radiology in Pulmonary Function Assessment and Diagnosis. Dyspnea is a common diagnostic challenge for the ED clinicians as well as outpatient physicians. It's what does dyspnea mean? So it stems from the Greek prefix dys, which means difficulty, and suffix neo to breathe. So putting that together, that means difficulty with breathing. Patients often report this as feeling short of breath. So diagnosing underlying lung disease, today's standard is a cocktail of a static chest x-ray, pulmonary function test, a chest CT, and a 2D transthoracic echocardiogram. But starting off this diagnostic workup is a static chest x-ray. It's the first line. So this is the typical static chest x-ray we see. The trachea is midline. The cardiac silhouette size is within normal limits. The lungs are clear. There's no focal airspace opacity. And the pleural recesses are clear as well. Moving on to the dynamic x-ray machine that we have at St. Luke's Hospital, Mount Sinai, on the left, you see the advanced U-arm and also the wireless flat panel detector on the right, and that's used to acquire the sequential images needed to create the video of respiration. We'll be seeing videos later in this presentation. But first, we need to talk about cost and radiation dose. So an average CT scan costs approximately $1,900, and the radiation exposure is about 1.5 millisieverts for a low-dose CT. A high-dose CT, the radiation exposure is approximately 7 millisieverts. But dynamic X-ray, the radiation exposure is very small. It's 0 0.02 millisieverts and costs only $420 in comparison to a CT scan. Pulmonary function testing, no radiation exposure, but the cost is significant at $2,400. So this is the dynamic x-ray, and on the right is the diaphragmatic waveform. So here you could just see the cardiac silhouette in motion, the diaphragm's moving. Now that's inspiration maximum, and the diaphragms are moving symmetrically. And now this is forced expiration, diaphragm's moving up. And this is, again, going through the tidal breathing. And here's a lateral view of what the dynamic x-ray looks in a healthy patient. Cardiac silhouette in motion, diaphragm moving symmetrically, the bucket handle motion, and then we're going to see the obliteration of the retrocardiac space during forced expiration. Now, looking at a COPD patient, the dynamic x-ray, you see basically these ill-defined reticular opacities throughout the lungs. And moving on to the waveform, there's symmetric motion of the diaphragms 
during the breathing, and now during the force inspiration, and moving on to the force expiration. It's probably hard to visualize, but there is decreased movement of the diaphragms compared to healthy patients. I'm going to show a video side-by-side -side comparison. On the left is the COPD patient, and on the right is the healthy patient. Just if you could take a moment, just visualize that the diaphragm is not moving as much compared to in a healthy patient. So really, in that COPD patient, the diaphragm is not moving much up and down compared to the healthy patient. So at Mount Sinai and St. Luke's, we've used this dynamic x-ray machine in 30 patients from the pulmonary clinic after they got their routine static chest x-ray. And of course, they had their pulmonary function testing performed. So the results that we've extrapolated from these 30 patients, nine patients demonstrated a normal diaphragm motion. Two patients had bronchiectatic changes. Six patients had a mixed restrictive and obstructive lung pattern. Two patients with obstructive lung disease that was not appreciated on a PFTs, but we saw it on dynamic x-ray. And then lastly, five patients had clear pulmonary hypertension. So just looking at these three static x-rays, would you be able to tell whether a patient has a mixed obstructive, restrictive lung pattern or bronchiectasis or some sort of neuromuscular disease, just looking at it alone? So this image represents at Mount Sinai and St. Luke's, we, on our second floor, we have a multi-specialty multi clinic where the patients come, they see the pulmonologist, and that's on the second floor. And then on the third floor, we conveniently have the regular x-ray machine as well as the dynamic x-ray machine. So that is convenient for these patients that we know have a limited pulmonary reserve to get supplemental workup and imaging. And this is the corridor heading just straight off the elevators, convenient for our patients to head to get their dynamic x-ray on the third floor. So from the information and results that we've got from the dynamic chest x-ray, it leads to better diagnosis and management. It's simple, it's cost-effective, it's patient-friendly, and it identifies mis misdiagnoses that we were not able to obtain from the cocktail of tests. So we propose a whole new chest x-ray report that integrates the findings from a dynamic x-ray. So starting off with a patient in the ED, a former smoker, COPD patient, comes in with acute exacerbation of shortness of breath. And then we know this patient already had pulmonary function tests from June 2018 in the outpatient setting with the FEV1 to FVC ratio of 54% and the FEV1 percentile of 54. And the technique would just read, similar to a standard x-ray report, PA and left lateral static views of the chest. Subsequently, then we obtained the PA and left lateral dynamic views of the chest during regular force inspiratory and expiratory respiration. And then the radiation exposure is approximately 0.4 milligrays. So just to summate the findings that we will see, the superior mediastinum hyla and cardiac silhouette size are within normal limits and demonstrates normal motion. There is no vascular congestion. Lungs demonstrate no focal airspace opacity, pleural effusion, or pneumothorax. The lungs do appear hyperinflated. And with the dynamic imaging, we're able to visualize that the lungs demonstrate air trapping with minimal air movement during tidal breathing and during forced aspiration. There is synchronous motion of the diaphragm, but decreased acceleration. So these are all key findings that the clinicians would need to know in the ED. So the overall impression would be acute exacerbation of COPD with findings concerning for impending acute respiratory failure. And then just noting who you spoke with, the ED provider, Dr. Samuelson, at the time of dictation. This would just add a significant amount of information for the ED clinicians. 
So the ongoing work that we're doing with dynamic chest radiography is working with COPD patients, especially as they evolve from a mild state to a more severe state of the COPD and looking at the respiratory pattern and how it changes with the diaphragmatic movement. As well as calculating the lung volumes is what we're also looking at and compared to our gold standard of pulmonary function testing. And we were, we're also looking at healthy patients to see if there are some variabilities that are within normal limits for healthy patients. Um, common issues that pulmonologists face with PFTs are limited availability, Limit and also lab variability, depending on operators um, doing the PFTs, as well as patients' variability and effort, because PFTs are very driven by the results of effort from each patient. Another challenge um, are for obese patients getting into the body box, which is very restrictive in size, as well as we notice from our patients that we've seen that there is some mispathology that we were able to appreciate with the dynamic imaging. Future applications we envision are using dynamic x-ray in the emergent settings, also using dynamic x-ray in the ICU for mechanically ventilated patients. Potentially, this could be a useful tool in seeing how the patients are doing with respiration before doing their trial of extubation on the floors. Like I alluded to before, we are looking at 3D volumetric assessment of the lung volumes and other organ systems that we will be exploring are orthopedics and cardiac. Now I hand it over to the rest of the panel up here, and we're going to go over a few cases, starting off with case one. So hi, everyone. Um, so we have a few cases. Uh, and um, case, each case, we will present a static chest x-ray along with a pulmonary function test. Um, we'll go through the question of what you think um, is the diagnosis and just basic obstruction, restriction, neither or both. And then we'll show you the dynamic x-ray and then um, see if your di diagnosis change from that. And we'll just um, basically describe what we see with the dynamic chest x-ray images. So for case one, we have this uh, static chest x-ray and the pulmonary function tests with an FEV1 to FEC ratio of 84%, FEV1 1.6 liters, 75%, and TLC of 3.11 liters and 60%. So based off of this data, the PFT and the static chest x-ray, what, um, what does this patient have? And again, just very broad um, diagnosis, nothing too specific. So restrictive, obstructive, both, neither. What do you think is going on? So based on the PFT data, and it's restrictive based on the uh, low TLC, um, Looking at the chest x-ray, maybe it's a little bit difficult to see that it is restrictive. Again, we are lacking some information just from a static chest x-ray. Um, so we'll go on to the dynamic x-ray now to see if there's anything that the dynamic adds that um, you know, we couldn't see from this static chest x-ray and the PFT data that we, we have. So right off from the, from the get-go, um, even on the static chest x-ray, you can see that this patient is obese. Um, we do see, so she's breathing at relatively low lung volumes for tidal breathing. So she's at rest. She breathes at low lung volumes. We think this is from her obesity and her restrictive process, the obesity causing the restrictive process. The other thing that we do see with forced expiration it's a relatively uh, slower speed of her diaphragm excursion, which is something that we've seen with our COPD population, with our asthmatics. And this is comparing to the normals that we do have and the normals that we have seen. Normals tend to have a faster diaphragm excursion during forced expiration than with our COPDs or asthmatics. And we think that is due to the dynamic airway collapse the airways collapse, you can't push out that air as fast as a normal patient would, and so you have decreased diaphragm exclusion. Another thing with this, uh, with this image, 
Um, she has a small, uh, just right here, medial hernia, um, which you can really appreciate on the chest X-ray. Um, the dynamic X-ray uh, makes this hernia a little bit more identifiable than on the regular chest X-ray. Um, subsequent CT chest imaging for this patient does also show some mammalization in the in the in the in the diaphragm, um, and we also see that the lateral aspect of her. <coughs> diaphragm on the, on the right um, moves separately from that medial segment. So the dynamic x-ray picked up that, yes, this patient is breathing at low lung volumes, consistent with her obesity, consistent with the restrictive process. Her diaphragm speed in, during forced expiration is slightly slower than what we would see for a normal patient, consistent with an obstructive process. And she also has a medial hernia that we did not see on chest X-ray. So some of these things, missed on chest X-ray, missed on PFT's dynamic X-ray, was able to pick up. Does anybody have any questions? Um, upright. Pardon? Patient is upright for all. Yes, standing. Yeah. You said they could be using the ICU. So how does? Going to show a case of that. How does that work? So we have not started um, imaging in the ICU just yet. We're waiting for IRB approval, but we have a portable uh, machine that we're going to use in the ICU for vent any patient really, but ventilated patients specifically. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'll move on to case number two. So a little bit more to the pulmonary function test. So we see um, FEV1, which is 98%, looks good. The ratio is 81%. The TLC, total lung capacity of 5.27, 76%. Um, this patient has some inspiratory, uh, so this specifically is the diaphragm pressures that we're looking at, the maximum inspiratory pressure. Um, it was done in the upright and supine uh, position. So 142 centimeters of water and 116 centimeters of water, and then the maximum expiratory pressure, 154 and 168. So slightly decreased maximum expiratory pressure, um, just below normal um, for the expiratory pressure in the upright position. We have a static chest X-ray. Nothing whopping there, um, otherwise looks, <clears throat> looks like a normal chest X-ray. So again, based off of the data, the chest X-ray, the PFT is, again, broadly diagnosing what does this patient have. Restrict, um, restriction, obstruction, both, neither. Is this just a normal, normal patient? So show you the dynamic uh, image for this patient. So we saw a nice tidal breathing, nice diaphragm excursion, simultaneous movement during tidal breathing. We see good, nice forced inspiratory effort, simultaneous movement during the forced inspiration. And just towards the end, you see that that left diaphragm was a little bit precocious, jumped up ahead of the right um, uh, hemidiaphragm, um, no longer simultaneous. This patient came in with shortness of breath. Um, the only abnormality we see here is towards the end of the film where that right hemidiaphragm um, basically contracts sooner than the left hemidiaphragm. This patient came in, like I said, with shortness of breath, and we suspect that what is happening here is something called um, a penduluft ventilation where the left hemidiaphragm elevating at a faster rate or sooner than the right hemidiaphragm, out of sync with the right hemidiaphragm, it causes air to move from the left thorax, the left lung, into the right lung because of the differences in compliance, differences in pressures. So this patient isn't able to exhale as we would normally exhale in healthy patients. There's a back and forth movement, right, left to right, um, with this patient causing dyspnea. This patient actually, so the diagnosis, so there's discoordinated <coughs> hemidiaphragm movement. This patient, he's a 38-year-old gentleman and has a history of shock or merry tooth. Physical exam findings in terms of neurologic findings are completely normal, except for dyspnea. Um, 
in terms of respiratory failure or respiratory abnormalities in patients with Charcot-Marie Tooth is not something that is seen earlier on in the disease process. Usually the patients have progressed. Um, they are showing some signs of neurologic dysfunction before you see worsening of their respiratory status. There have been uh, case reports and few case reports um, in literature um, talking about sporadic respiratory failure in patients with Charcot-Mary tooth. And the dynamic x-ray allows us to see this in this patient who would have otherwise been deemed completely normal. Normal neurologic status, PFTs are otherwise fine, chest x-ray looks great. But we're able to see this um, discoordinated hemidiaphragm movement, this pendulum ventilation in this patient with Charcot-Mary tooth. So case number three. Um, we have a chest x-ray, not normal as the uh, previous ones, but um, we have this chest x-ray, static chest x-ray, PFTs with a ratio of 74%, FEV1 of 80%, and TLC, total lung capacity of 76%. So based off of this data, um, what does this patient have broadly? Restriction, obstruction, both, neither. So we'll move on to the dynamic x-ray. So what we saw previously on that chest x-ray, that chest x-ray was read as slight uh, hazy reticular opacity, um, particularly on the left heart border, um, no confluent infiltrate, early pneumonia should be excluded. What we see with the dynamic x-ray, um, I, I believe this is what was uh, being looked at as a uh, possible hazy opacity, possible pneumonia. But what we see with the dynamic x-ray is that there is pulsation in this area um, that was referred to as a hazy opacity. We see pulsation. It's consistent with the pulmonary artery. And we see, we've seen this with num uh, numerous patients with varying severities of pulmonary hypertension. The pulsation, the prominent pulsation of the pulmonary artery, right or left, um, consistent with pulmonary hypertension. What we see here as well, um, you know, is that dynamic x-ray is less likely to miss a pneumonia. Um, you see, you know, re relatively normal lung tissue surrounding the area. It's a little bit hazy, but you do see normal lung tissue around the area. So chest x-ray read as possible pneumonia, dynamic x-ray with the movement, with the pulsation of the pulmonary vessel consistent with pulmonary hypertension. Case number four. So PFT ratio is 69%, FEV1 of 62%. The total lung capacity is 73%, but this was less than the lower limit of normal. Um, we use ranges sometimes uh, for, uh, for any abnormalities with, with the spirometry as well as for the lung, for the lung volume. <coughs> Again, based off of these, um, of, off of this data, what does this patient have? Is it restriction, obstruction, both, or neither? And again, that goes along with the total lung capacity of less than the lower limit of normal. Um, again, this patient had some shortness of breath, and we were trying to evaluate why. So we see big thing from the get-go, that left um, thorax is, you know, is loss of uh, lung volume on the left compared to the right. She has good diaphragm exclusion during um, tidal breathing. If you don't mind playing it again, please. So during tidal breathing, there's good diaphragm exclusion. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of, we'll play that again, if you don't mind. So right here, if you look at this part of the left hemidiaphragm, there's early, um, if you want to call it early eventration of that left hemidiaphragm. You see a little bit of scarring there at the left base. Again, it's very subtle changes that you would not pick up on a PFT or pick up on a static chest x-ray, just right here. You see that little bit of scarring. This patient actually had uh, TB in the past. Um, she also has some asthma, but we suspect that this early eventration that 
tenting and that scarring of that left hemidiaphragm and the, and the pleura as well was causing some of her, her symptoms of shortness of breath, in addition to the uh, left lung volume loss. So again, it points out the di uh, dynamic x-ray, you know, shows you that uh, diaphragmatic paradox. This one is a little bit milder than the one that we saw in case number two. This patient did not have any pulmonary function tests. She had a static chest X-ray. Um, I mean, it's kind of obvious. Um, she has uh, what looks like is it a left lung opacity. Um, we can't really see the hemidiaphragm on the left. And the right looks to be somewhat normal. So what is the diagnosis for this patient? Does she have, I mean, is it a pleural effusion? Is it opacity, left lung, white out? Um, what is going on with this patient? So we did a dynamic chest X-ray and we compared her diaphragm exclusion um, waveforms. So the purple uh, waveform is the right and the red waveform is left. So what we see here actually is that she has a left hemidiaphragm elevation, but it's not completely paretic. It's, there's still some movement there. We highlighted this case as uh, this patient also had a hernia. Um, she was being evaluated by surgery for um, intervention and they deemed her high risk because of that static chest x-ray. She was deemed high risk for procedure. However, we see that this hemidiaphragm is not completely paralyzed, that there is still some, some movement with this diaphragm. So she's not as high risk as one would think. And we see the movement again um, with, with the waveforms. There's not as much movement on the left, but there is still movement on that left side. And most of that hemidiaphragm elevation was hernia as well. And we also have a lateral just to show the difference um, in the left and right hemidiaphragms. Okay, so moving on to case number six. Uh, this is a patient who presented for the first time uh, with shortness of breath, and we don't have uh, results of pulmonary function testing. Um, and this is the you know, routine chest X-ray that we did for this patient. Um, as you can see, if you want to report this, there is a lot of possible findings that we can make. Let's say if, if I want to report this, you can see uh, there is like patchy opacities here, and at some, you know, some areas are even, let's say, tubular shape. It could be atelectasis, could be pneumonia. And then looking at other areas, you see some possible, possible centrally loosened areas um, uh, and if you want to have a differential for them, we could, we could say um, they are, you know, dilated bronchi or, let's say, centrally loosened lesions here, 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 and then uh, increased bronchovascular markings and maybe some reticulation. So basically, a lot of findings that we can make based on this chest X-ray, but there's a lot of possible findings that we don't have definite answer for them. Well, for this patient, we also did dynamic imaging, and the next one. Um, as, as you can see here, now, let's say, look at this tubular structure here. You can follow it uh, towards the hilum, and you can say, well, these are like dilated bronchi. And basically, uh, you know, dilated bronchi, and then all those loosened areas that we, see, we saw here, they are basically uh, in fast bronchi, um, and then we actually come up to diagnose the bronchiectasis for this patient. We have increased reticulation, so, uh, which was basically um, not definitive on static X-ray imaging. But here we have, with more information, we can more definitively say, well, this patient has bronchiectasis. And looking at these areas, one of the things that uh, when we see these patchy opacities, um, there's usual differential diagnosis for them. It could be aspiration, could be atelectasis, could be pneumonia. Well, the thing is, if it is atelectasis with lying movement, uh, with inspiration, that atelectasis would go away. But here, what you see is that these 
opacities, they don't go away, they basically move with the line parenchymal. So that raises the possibility, you can more definitively say this is a parenchymal disease, this is pneumonia, or some parenchymal process going on, this is not atelectasis. The other thing is uh, we can follow these tubular structures here, you know, you see the prebronchial coughing, you know, so you look at this, like let's say this tubular structure and goes all the way to the hilum. And so, well, these are all dilated bronchi here. And then even this tubular shape opacity here, uh, you can actually more uh, definitively say this is probably like an impact impacted bronchi as opposed to, uh, let's say, atelectasis. Uh, so we have for confirmation, we got a CT for this patient, uh, which is the next slide. Um, as you can see, you see like dilated bronchi, and then this is the, you know, the signet uh, ring sign, and bronchiectus is here, impacted, uh, impacted bronchi here and here. So we could actually get a lot of these findings from that dynamic, from that dynamic X-ray. If you go back to dynamic, um, we also could um, uh, potentially get the diagnosis of COPD here. You can see, you know, uh, increased work of breathing here, and the patient has to actually force free move the diaphragm for breathing. Uh, and then you see the pattern of obstruction and hyperinflation of the lungs, and, you know, the lungs are basically in expiration are not deflating well. So you actually get a sense of COPD. So several diagnoses you make with this dynamic X-ray, that you could not make with um, a static X-ray. Was uh, the opacities here, impacted bronchi, uh, COPD, and all these findings that you could more definitively diagnose with, with basically the added value of dynamic imaging as opposed to static imaging. So those are all the cases we have for today. Um, just to summarize, dynamic X-ray streamlines the workup and process in evaluating for shortness of breath. And dynamic x-ray, for the first time, allows us to visualize the complex interactions of the bones, the muscles, the lungs, as well as the diaphragm during the respiratory process. So this is personalized medicine. Do you have any questions for us? Okay. Thank you all.